And now we come to the thing that it actually kind of should bring it all together. Uh, and it's a word that is used in every context I can think of. The best example I came across recently was an organization called the Strategic Lorry Park uh, Limited. Now, quite where the word strategy and parking lorries and logistics works together, I don't know. But I do find that everybody talks about their, their people strategy and their brand strategy and their marketing strategy and their tech strategy and everything else. And somewhere through there, there is a discipline called strategy, which I would argue is just as important as finance. So let me now turn to my panel. And I'm delighted that we have four amazing people who are coming to join us today for the panel. Zoe Bailey who is the head of strategic operations at Withers and Rogers Group, was at BDO for many years. Um, James Falkenbridge, um, bringing that uh, much more sort of cerebral perspective as an economic geographer, uh, assistant um, dean at uh, the University of Lancaster Management School, worked very closely with us on the recent project. Uh, Derek Klin, who is a partner of PFSI, an accountant like me, uh, saw the light, moved into other and more interesting things maybe, but he works with leaders of professional firms, um, as a consultant, and then Rosemary, who um, knows more about innovation, I think, than anybody I've ever met, uh, apart from fitting in a lot of saving, which she's brilliant at as well. So welcome, one and all. The, the first one was uh, an observation. In fact, this was research that the forum did a um, week or so back, maybe a month, where we looked at the whole issue of has strategy lost ground to operations during the lockdown? And the overwhelming feedback from the those who completed that poll was, absolutely to the extent that no firm indicated that it was the other way around in other words no firm had strategy uh, actually been more important than operations does that matter so i was going to kind of ask zoe to kind of just give us some thoughts on does it matter from your point of view that strategy has lost ground to operations over the past 15 months or so and um, seeing as that video is um Chief Strategy Officer, you can probably uh, predict my answer, but yes, I believe it does matter because I believe that what we decide today has an impact on how we will do business in the future. So if you omit thinking strategically, you risk making poor knee-jerk decisions, which could have lasting implications. Um, just for example, if you take the entertainment industry who have been obliterated by the pandemic, they've had to let people go to survive in the short term, but this action has had an unintended consequence. Those people now have left the industry, many through necessity to find new employment and are unlikely to return. Their skills and experience therefore have been lost. And in addition to this, people will be less likely to return to a risky, what they deem as a risky sector in the future in case they lose their jobs again. So an immediate action to survive the here and now has led to a lasting implication for that sector. Uh, and this is where scenario planning can really help um, begin in the 1980s and now back with a vengeance. And I remember listening to an excellent session on this as part of the retuning sessions. Um, so thinking through scenarios, thinking strategically is a safe way really to help a business move forward. Um, and as Warren Buffett said, someone is sitting in a shade today because somebody planted a tree a long time ago. Uh, James, just kind of uh, welcome your thoughts on this. I mean, I remember some years ago, um, Steve Jobs was supposed to have, when he took, went back into Apple for the second time, he he realized that the kit was very unreliable and he therefore thought, well, if I get rid of most of the product lines down to about four or five great computers and then I don't need two and a half thousand people in my customer services team anymore. And I think 25 would do fine. And But he didn't sack anybody. The other 2,475 were all told to go away and come back to something useful, out of which apparently came iTunes and a number of other elements. So to what extent do you think this... Um, process that we've lived through is going to lead to fundamental shifts in the way that people view jobs and the role of strategy. It's kind of inevitable that operations became the focus um, because of the, the dr dramatic disruption and change. But but I think the key thing, that, that we're, the point that we've reached now is, is to recognise, first of all, that now is clearly the term, time to return to strategy and to think about what that means for the future. Um, but also to, to kind of connect to, to, to Zoe's point, to recognise that strategy and operations are not, not disconnected. Um, and so 
actually use, of course, deliver your strategy through your operations um, on a day-to-day -day kind of basis, and you need to link the two together. Um, and actually, to kind of come back to your, your kind of initial setup, um, actually what your people are doing and how they operate and, and their, the nature of their work and their roles needs to be fundamentally tied into to that long-term kind of strategic goal. So, so in many ways, strategy perhaps has a slightly longer time scale to it, and we think about where we want to be in one, three, five years' time. But there's lot of, a lot of operational activity to get you to that end point that needs to be considered and needs to be tied in. And I often try to think about how you could effectively align all of your operational plans under broader kind of strategic umbrellas. And that includes thinking about what your people are doing, how they're structured, and organized. And so back to your, your analogy of out of customer service and into coming up with new ideas. It's about thinking about how the fundamental structures of your operations are feeding the strategic kind of priority. So, so I think, you know, we're at a particular moment where there's an opportunity to learn from the kind of operational focus that's been necessary in the past 18 months and to feed that into the way we, we kind of move forward and think about the, the kind of next step in, in the strategy, which to echo some of the things in previous panels, you know, so much has been learned that it seems fairly inconceivable that, that the strategy now would look like it would have looked two years ago. Surely we've learned things and the world's changed in a way that requires to learn from, from that operational focus for a period of time. Okay, thank you. I'd like to bring Derek in now and um, talk a little bit about Cascades. I mean, one of the things that um, I have found is that uh, a board will come up with a strategy um, and it may be a fantastic strategy uh, until the rubber hits the road, that is. and how do you actually how do you actually move a strategy from that small group of people who've gone away and come up with something and to something that is actually not just oh this is today's job but actually do people really come behind get engaged and feel yeah this is something that i really support how do you how do you go about that cascade from sign off to uh buy in I think there's a fundamental thing to start off with in terms of your mindset as to whether strategy is something that is written in a document and then presented to the board, the board approves it, and the board then tries to cascade it, or whether you think that the strategy is actually, especially in a professional services firm where, where you're trying to, to manage and leave, lead by consensus as opposed to top down, that you have to involve people right from the beginning. So I think that communication, for example, of strategy, doesn't start when the strategy is signed off it starts right at the beginning when you're even thinking about the strategy and that if you involve people and clients throughout the process and continually sort of touch base with what they're thinking uh, what, what they're seeing in the marketplace feeding it back and informing your strategy by the time you get to the strategy being sort of signed off as it were um, it's already been communicated you've already gone halfway in terms of cascading it down and therefore it should be quite quite a lot easier a because people have been involved throughout the process and and they've also therefore owned part of it as well so therefore the cascade uh, becomes more effective and then after that i think it's a question of keep on repeating the message we did some re research uh, some time ago about what makes a successful managing partner and one of the things that came through is keep on repeating the message and you know having got the strategy be able to summarize it very succinctly and then cascade it down and, and, and keeping along with that I think the other thing I'll just say in, in terms of the context of that previous conversation as well is I agree with lots of what James was saying about of the operations and strategy and in a way the operational focus should have been within the context of existing strategies uh, and as Mintzberg also espoused you've got a spouse strategy so people may have had strategies back at the beginning of 2020 uh, but also then you've got emergent strategies and I'm sure lots of firms now have they may not recognize it emergent strategies where they have uh, adapted because of the changes that we all encountered our, uh, over the last year. And therefore, I think strategy has always been there, but perhaps it's just been less visible um, in that last year. Um, I'll come to Rosemary in a minute and kind of look a little bit about the interaction of strategy and innovation. But um, I'm interested really from Zoe, from your point of view, um, one of the, because uh, you've obviously had a lot of experience of rolling out a strategy, put it that way, but what, one, of, one of the sort of research I've been looking at recently kind of says, well, that when times are really uncertain, um, actually traditional strategic tools don't really work. 
um, and therefore, and can be dangerous, in fact, because you're not really focusing on new threats and opportunities. Yeah, and I think um, I agree with what Derek was saying in terms of actually you, you've got your kind of foundation of strategies and that then there are those emerging strategies that, that come along the way. And certainly we've seen a lot of emerging strategies in the last uh, 12, 16 months. Um, so if I if I think back at BDO, when we set out our, we used an acronym and build as our strategy there, that we felt was all encompassing in terms of really picking up on the critical parts that were going to lead that business forward in the future. We certainly placed emphasis on areas that might not have been um, prioritised previously, but in the round, when we brought it together, we felt that that was a really strong, robust strategy to lead us for future success. Um, and similarly, where I'm working now, it's it's thinking about, OK, what have we um, experienced in the last 12 months that have led us to the position we're in now that we can really take advantage of some of that change um, and really escalate some of the strategies that, that might have been there, um, as Derek was saying, you know, for, for a while that we've actually managed to achieve, bam, bam, thank you, ma'am, in 12 months. Um, but now where do we want to get to um, in the future? And then again, taking a holistic view um, across the business and bringing those together into a really coherent story and message that can be absorbed within the business with, with people, but also um, externally when you then talk about who you are, what you stand for, what your purpose is and what you're trying to achieve in the market. And, and I think lots of um, models um, can, can be very helpful in terms of just trying to visualise that and bring that to life for people. Uh, Rosemary, I was... Um... I mentioned earlier was looking to uh, explore the the interaction of of innovation and strategy and the the extent I mean does a strategy have to be innovative hello um yes I mean I think the thing is when you look back and, and you think for organizations what is innovation I mean innovation is doing something new so if you look back over the last 18 months everybody's had to pivot everybody's had to change have they innovated in essence uh, probably not a lot of people adopted technologies that were existing uh, teams wasn't designed to respond to the pandemic it's been around for years same as zoom but lots of people had to innovate their culture and they had to adapt and they had to adopt and that in itself is innovation of a type when organisations think of innovation, I think they think, oh, wow, we've got to think of a new product or a new service line or we've got to do this amazing thing to call it innovation. But actually, a simple change in how you address co-creation, which Derek was referring to there, which I think is really key for making sure that you engage your value chain in anything that you do, but especially your strategy right through to your client. You know, doing co-creation and crowdsourcing ideas and bringing it together, that's an innovative culture. And so if you apply that to your strategic development, I think you get further faster. I think that's the key. Um, do you have to be innovative? I mean, I think by definition, organisations in a competitive world where market share is finite, I think by definition, they are innovative, even if they themselves may not recognise it as such. And everybody to a degree has been innovative more than ever before over the last 18 months. So I think it's almost a given and it's a question for the board or the executive as to how far you push that in terms of culture and explicit activities. When you raised this question before, I thought it was quite interesting because innovation is something that has been quite a top, hot topic over the last uh, few years or so. Uh, but if we think about innovative thinking and there's also that sort of what is innovation as opposed to creativity. Innovation involves sort of three phases about the creative, then the development and then the implementation. And I just thought that really is just applies as much as the strategy that you have to come up with your strategy, the creative part of the strategy, but then you have to develop, you know, the means to deliver the strategy and then you have to execute it. And so much of, you know, when we refer to strategy is often thought of as just being the creative bit, the coming up with the strategy. The strategy really encompasses, just like innovation does, those three parts, the creation, the development, and then the execution the implementation. Just wanted to add that. Yeah, and there's a lovely word, coherent. I always say if your strategy isn't coherent, in other words, capable of being delivered or implemented, then it's not a strategy, it's a wish list. And there are lots of boards that have wish lists. Um, I'm quite interested also in exploring another issue, which is around um, <clears throat> often a, a strategy will or may, may not need to, but will involve behavior change. In other words, that whatever the strategy is in terms of thinking, um, 
it will almost certainly only work if the people on the front line are willing to change their behavior in some way, particularly if it's uh, associated with clients. And how, how you might go about, what, what's, what's the balance there? To what extent do you think it's fine to assume that people will change their behavior? To what extent does that need to be built into the strategic development? I think this takes us back to some of the things that Derek was pointing out earlier that we have to remember we're here talking about professional service firms um, and, and there's some subtle differences of course compared with a, a typical hierarchical corporation where it's too simplistic to say you're told to change and you do but but there's a more kind of command and control top-down kind of model um, in a professional service firm we all know that doesn't really work and, and that takes us back to how you develop your strategy and I completely agree that you know, a strategy doesn't cascade down from the top um, after a decision is made a strategy should be an iterative process of, of dialogue and of course it has to be structured depending on the size of the organization so, so actually when it comes to change um, change will be facilitated if if the majority and it will never be everybody but if the majority understand the, the logic behind the strategy the reason where it's emerged from and, and feel some degree of ownership of it and and you will never have complete agreement you will never have everybody um, believing that all the decisions are right but often if people feel they've had their chance to influence and have their voice heard um, and at least have heard the reasons that the strategy is going in a particular direction and why particular change is needed, you have a much greater chance of people being willing to, to then kind of go on the journey that, that's required. So so I think it, it's very much, and it's, I suppose, back to it's an, another layer to add into the, the discussion around, you call it coherence, Richard, and, and, and Derek was talking about the kind of three stages. Well, well, in many ways, um, a strategy isn't coherent if it, in a professional service firm if it doesn't have that general broad degree of consensus that the process of producing it and um, ultimately then the focus of the strategy is something that there's a consensus about. And so that's only the start. There's still a lot of work to do, of course, even, even when you have that and it requires continual kind of reinforcement and, and also a willingness to listen and, and potentially adapt as you go along. So the emergent strategies can become important here. Um, but but I, I do think, you know, the, a holistic view that underst understands the start point to the end point, but also the many steps along the way um, and the way that you bring people along through those steps is, is the crucial part of really ensuring the change does become possible. Taking that to the next stage, I think then that um, this is when strategy and communication become um, bedfellows because you can't, um, you won't engage with your people without those really compelling, strong communications that, that help it land, um, help you engage with your teams in a way that um, excites them, ignites them and, and enables them to understand what that means for them at an individual level. Um, so, you know, you need that really compelling communication strategy to underpin it, but but also your communication won't be successful unless you've got that cohesive strategy in the first place. Um, so to me, that they're, they're, they're very much aligned. So when you get to that stage when you then want to engage, that's when communication becomes critical. And for me, storytelling is so important. So when you're talking about your strategy, bringing it to life in, in, in the work that you do, making it real, making it tangible, making it relatable at that individual level is really crucial. One of, the, one of the questions I kind of wonder often is that people have a big debate about who owns strategy and it does the same apply to innovation? Does somebody own innovation in a firm? Is that the board? Is it the leader? Is it the people who, whose behaviour needs to change or is it a co collaborative effort? In which case does it become more like a hippie camp? Yeah I mean I think you know look, when it comes to innovation uh, no idea is a bad idea. So that's the first thing I always say to people. There is a job, I think, in an organisation of a certain size to have somebody who facilitates the innovation process, who makes it happen, who opens the doors, who connects the dots, who ensures that innovation is really happening for the organisation. If you get into a very large organisation, you may find that some things that are being proposed are already being done somewhere else because the knowledge base is perhaps not as effective and efficient as it could be. So there is a role to facilitate innovation. You always need a sponsor for innovation because it's not going to happen at zero cost. It's either going to take somebody's time and in some cases explicit investment. So you're going to need a sponsor at the executive or the board level um, to help you see that through. But other than that, I think everybody in an organisation should be encouraged to participate 
in the innovation process. And I think this is where you get into a really powerful environment because what I think we've learned over many, many years um, is that when you talk to the people in an organization and the, the latest group I spoke to about something like this was actually in the automotive sector. So not a professional services firm in exactly the same way. But what was fascinating is they said, you know, these people came in and told us about innovation. They told us a whole load of stuff that they'd asked us before. And, and, and we told them we already knew. And I think what's really interesting is the people in the organization will typically have solutions and ideas and improvements. And innovation doesn't have to be this like I said before, you know, this massive, uh, oh, wow, here's the new iPhone equivalent. It can also be incremental improvements in your operations that drive margin um, and improve something for perhaps either the employees or the clients or anybody along that, that journey. So I think innovation should be owned by everybody, but it should be sponsored by somebody and facilitated by somebody. That's, that's my view on that. And if we, I guess, apply the same metric to strategy, then it should be sponsored by the board, um, facilitated by the leadership team and owned by everybody. And that isn't what you read in the textbooks. Um, James, wh wh where do you think we're moving away from the traditional models here? I suppose some of the traditional models, of course, are somewhat dated and, uh, and don't necessarily always reflect the way that organisations now operate, and particularly what motivates people, perhaps. And of course, COVID's changed that again. And and most of the models are not written about professional service firms as well. That's important to note. You know, many of them will have come out of manufacturing or, or other environments. So, so I, I'm not sure actually that the model is to go use the word that innovative or radically changed um i think it's about understanding you know how how it fits with the the kind of mood music of the moment really and and i think again covid has changed that in terms of the way that communication happens in organizations how people are managed you know all of that, that has been transformed in the, in the last 18 months so so i think it context is everything really and, and recognizing that and you know professional service firm is one context and then every organization has their own kind of particular circumstances um you know and, and it's for, for for professional service firms that are still partnership it's about thinking about what partnership now means and how that's evolved because partnership always was about collective ownership of the strategy effectively because it, you know the vote was the mechanism that, that led to a decision being made or not that's changed as partnerships have got bigger and have, have taken different forms but ultimately it, it's still a, a reflection of how you reinvent in many ways that idea of collective ownership but through different structures different mechanisms as organizations are bigger you know some are, may still say they have a partnership but technically in terms of governance they're not so so i think it's it is you know it isn't necessarily about following the textbook it's about kind of contextualizing the different elements of you know the story and, and working out for, for your organization how does that work for you um, given the way you operate the kind of people you employ and, and the way you govern yourselves as well not all partnerships operate the same way so isn't that a singular story even in that sense 